I wonder, how free do you feel? It's such a hot topic question right now because so much of what's happening with racial oppression, for example, is that certain freedoms are denied to some people and granted to others. It's a hot topic as well because all of us have had our freedoms cut off or narrowed or restricted by the lockdown that's happening. That was quite a severe uh, cutting off of many of our freedoms. But even given those caveats, I imagine if people asked you how free do you feel, you would probably say generally quite free. Yes, we recognise there are certain responsibilities and obligations we have. Children, you're obliged to uh, do as your parents teach you and ask you to do. Uh, you've got your teachers at school as well. Uh, parents, you've got bosses at work and, and a board of directors to answer to, perhaps. Uh, and of course, we've all got the government who rules over us and governs us. But generally, we would say we are free people, free to choose, free to live as we please. But I want to start today by saying that the Bible teaches that there is a very real sense in which none of us are free. As humans, we are unable by nature to live the kind of lives that God says are morally good. We are ultimately unable to choose what is right rather than what is wrong. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I don't mean to say that we're not free to make decisions. We are free to make decisions. And the Bible's keen to point out that we have the opportunity and the responsibility to make the right choices and that our choices matter. But, it says, the influence and the power of sin has so got hold of our, well, all of us, our, our hearts, our minds, our emotions, our will, our bodies. The power of sin has, has so got hold of us that ultimately we're, we're unable to make decisions apart from its influence. It always influences us. It always directs us. It always leads us down the same path. And that is the path of rejecting God. Choosing what is wrong rather than what is right. The Bible says we are slaves to sin. We are imprisoned by sin, by nature. We are held captive by our own rejection of God. A rejection that is so strong that the Bible even describes it, personifies it as a force that is outside of us, that, that exerts its will over us. Such is the strength of the sin that is in our hearts. Perhaps some of you disagree. Perhaps you're not quite convinced that really I am a slave to sin. But consider these examples which help illustrate the truth of what the Bible teaches here. Consider when you get a young child who is it that teaches the child how to do wrong? Children, have you got a brother or sister who's younger than you? Well, did you teach your brother and sister how to take your things off you? Did you teach your brother and sister how to tell a lie? Did you teach them how to disobey their parents? No, nobody, nobody teaches us how to do wrong. Rebelling, disobeying, doing the wrong thing seems to be just part of our nature. We have to be taught how to do the right thing. Think as well whether you'd be able to live a life that, that cut out even just one sin. Do you think you could live the rest of your life without telling a single lie? Without embellishing the truth? Without exaggerating? It'd be very difficult. In fact, it would be impossible, if you're honest. Have you been able to live up to it so far? And think as well, why is it that we still do those things that frustrate us, that cause us regret, that we know we don't want to do, yet we keep going back to doing them over and over again? Why do we do those things? Why is it that we can't break those habits? Why is it that we can't take control of our anger, of our lust, of our frustration, of our jealousy and envy? Why can't we avoid those sins? It's because sin has hold of our hearts. Well, nobody's perfect, you might say. Exactly. 
But why not? Why are we not perfect? Because sin has hold of our hearts. We are slaves to sin. And that's bad news. It's bad news because sin, every time, damages us, it damages those around us, and it leads to judgment. It damages us. You know that and you can feel that when you, when you consider just how your sin has affected you. Anger, in the heat of the moment, feels like the, the kind of response that will give you victory and that will give you satisfaction. If you just shout back in anger at the person who's arguing with you, you will win the argument. But actually, even if you do win the argument, it's not a sense of joy that you feel. It's a sense of bitterness and resentment. Anger robs us of what is good. Equally, uh, covetousness, jealousy, envy. It promises us that life will be so much better if we have those things. And yet all covetousness offers us is, well, it exhausts us as we're constantly chasing, trying to get the next thing, the next thing, the next thing that other people have and we don't. And lust as well. It offers us sensation, sensuality. And yet actually... All it really does to us is dull our senses and makes us insensitive to the things that we should be sensitive towards. It damages the world around us. It hurts our family. It hurts the people in society. Selfishness, by definition, always takes something away from other people to give it to ourselves. And there's no way that we can sin without offending or hurting or damaging those people around us. And most of all, sin is an offence against God. God loves this world. He loves the people in this world. He loves you more than you imagine. He loves his creation. And when your acts of sin damage yourself, the people around you, the world that he has made and that he's put you in, how could a loving God not respond with justice? And so what we find is that our sin sets us on a path that leads to judgment. God will punish sin. He will punish even our sin. The things that we have done wrong. What's the solution? How do we escape the damage that sin is doing to us? How, more importantly, do we escape the judgment that we are heading towards? Well, that's what I want to consider from Luke chapter 23 today. Let me just turn there. In Luke chapter 23, we've got a little historical detail, a little story, a little account of what happened to one man, Barabbas. And what happened to him serves as a picture of how we all can be released from the slavery, from the imprisonment that sin has us in. So far in the story, Jesus has been arrested, he's been tried by the Jews, and they really want him dead. And so they cook up some charges that they decide, right, we're going to accuse Jesus of being a rebel. We're going to accuse him of being a political uh, rioter, basically. And they take him to Pilate and they say, he opposes payment of taxes and claims to be Christ a king. Pilate, you've got to do something about him. You've got to put him to death. But Pilate doesn't believe these charges. He can't find anything in Jesus that he's done wrong. He sends him to Herod. Herod also says, now this man has done nothing wrong. He's innocent of these charges. But the crowd are having none of what Pilate's saying. Pilate calls together, I'm looking at verse 13 now, Pilate calls together the chief priests, the rulers and the people. Three groups there, the, the chief priests and the rulers, uh, those who've tried Jesus and found him guilty. Uh, and then the people, the crowd outside. And Pilate says to them, look, this man has done nothing wrong. He's innocent. He's no threat to the government. He's not causing riots. He's done nothing uh, that you accuse him of doing. But the crowd are baying for his blood. They say, with one voice they cry out, verse 18, Away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Release Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a different man altogether. We don't know a lot about him. In fact, all that we know is written here in this passage. 
um, we know that he was a prisoner, thrown into prison for, it says, insurrection, verse 19. Now, insurrection is rebellion against the king. What Barabbas was doing, he was a, a political rioter. He was getting a, a band of men together to, to try and overthrow the government and, and release his people from the, the tyranny of the, the cruel governments and their rule. Barabbas was the, the insurrectionist, the, the, the rebel rouser, the troublemaker. And as part of his attack on the government, as part of his riots, he'd been caught. He'd murdered a man. And so Barabbas has been thrown into prison. All of what he hoped would be victory, a new start, uh, a fresh opening for him and, and the nation he was part of has now ended him up, locked up in prison, trapped in a dungeon. And you can imagine the day of, the, of Barabbas's release. On the morning, Barabbas would have known that today was the Passover, how he would have loved to be free, to celebrate that meal with his family and his friends, just like the rest of the city were doing. And yet Barabbas is in chains, in a dungeon, locked up. And as he listens to the festivities outside of his window, uh, if he had a window, he hears the noise of the crowd. Uh, there's quite a big crowd in the city and, and he can hear them moving through the city. And as he listens, he hears a voice being called out. Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. Barabbas thinks this must be the day. His murder, his rebellion was a capital offence. Barabbas was in, in prison, essentially waiting to be killed. He knew that was his destiny. And he listens to the crowd. Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. Perhaps he thought, today's my day. Today's the day that I'm going to go. Today's the day that I will receive the judgment, the punishment for the wrong that I've done. He listens and he hears the prison officer walking through the prison, keys jangling in his pocket. He hears the steps getting closer and louder and they stop outside of his cell door. He hears the lock click. He hears the, the bars slide back on the door and the door swing open. And the prison guard walks towards Barabbas. He bends down. He undoes the shackles round his feet. And he undoes the shackles round his hands. And he turns towards Barabbas and he says, You're free to go. You're free to go. What? Just imagine for a moment what's running through Barabbas's mind. I'm free to go. I'm in here waiting to die. The crowd are shouting for me. Pilate is ready to, to kill a man, and surely I, I'm the man today. The prisoner says, Barabbas, you're free to go. Well, what's happened? What, why am I free to go? The prison officer says, well, look, you've received the, uh, the pardon from the governor. Pilate is letting you go, just like his custom is. At the feast, he, he lets a prisoner go, and you're the man today. And Barabbas says, but I, but I can hear the crowd baying for blood. Crucify him, crucify him. Listen, I can hear their words now. Crucify him, crucify him, they shout. And the prisoner says, well, they're not after you, Barabbas. They're after another man. Some man called Jesus. They reckon he's a, a rioter. Uh, they reckon he's the one uh, opposing Caesar. I can't say anything he's done wrong myself. But they want him dead all the same. And so Pilate's going to put him to death. Imagine what Barabbas felt that day. He would have been so overjoyed. I wonder where he went first. I wonder who he went to see, whether he had family, whether he went to find his wife, brothers and sisters, friends. Or I wonder whether he went out into the crowd to watch the death of the man who'd been killed while he was being released. The Bible doesn't tell us what happened to Barabbas. We don't know how he might have lived from that day on. But Barabbas is a perfect illustration of our own condition. And that's why the Bible speaks about him. Barabbas was a criminal. We all have sinned. Barabbas had broken the laws of the government, of the, the nation in which he lived. We have broken the laws of God. 
the creator in whose world we live. Barabbas was imprisoned and in his imprisonment he was waiting to face the judgment, the punishment, the just uh, punishment that he deserved. Our sin imprisons us, it enslaves us, it has hold of our hearts and our minds. And while we're in sin, while we're in this imprisonment, all we're doing is waiting for the judgment that we deserve. Waiting for the day to come. Waiting for the day we stand before God. Barabbas found freedom, was given freedom, when Jesus Christ, the innocent one, was crucified in his place. When Jesus, the innocent one, was accused of the very things Barabbas had done. Barabbas was the rioter, but they said Jesus was the rioter and they killed him for it. In the same way, we can have freedom from the sin that takes hold of us when we turn to Jesus. And all of our sin is laid upon Jesus. And he dies on our behalf. He takes the punishment so that it's removed from our head. So that we don't have to face it. So that we are granted freedom. And just imagine how Barabbas would have lived from that day on. Do you think he went back to, to rioting and opposing the government? I think probably not. It would just lead him to the same situation that he'd escaped. You know, in the same way, the gospel message isn't a license to just live as you please and, and do whatever you like. The gospel is an invitation to escape the sin that once had hold of you. To escape the damage that it was doing to you. The gospel invitation is an invitation to live in a way that pleases God and to honour him and to be free from the sin that once had hold of us. How the gospel ought to change our life. How it gives us freedom to fight against the sin that damages us. But you know, this illustration of Barabbas being freed from prison is incomplete, let's say. It's a good illustration. We are totally enslaved to sin. We are imprisoned by it. We do need to be freed, not by anything that we do. Barabbas didn't fight his way out of prison. He couldn't do anything to make up for the wrong he'd done. He had to be freed by someone else. In the same way, we need to be freed from our imprisonment to sin by Jesus dying on our behalf. But the limitation of this illustration is that when Barabbas was freed, he had no say in the matter. He didn't ask for it. He didn't know it was going to happen. He didn't respond to Jesus. And we're not told how Barabbas lived afterwards. We're not told that he did go and find Jesus. We're not told that he did become a disciple. But you know, when the Bible talks about the gospel, the Bible makes it clear that when Jesus died on the cross, to pay the punishment for our sin. We don't receive the benefit of what he's done without responding to him. We don't receive the benefit of the freedom from sin without responding to Jesus. And the response to Jesus is one of repentance, re turning away from sin, turning our backs on sin, and a response that chooses to follow Jesus. Repent from sin, and follow Jesus. Our own response to Jesus is vitally important. Because without our response, then we don't receive the benefits that he has earned for us. We don't receive that forgiveness. We don't have our sin taken from us and placed on Jesus. Without a response to Jesus, our sin lays on our own head. And so before we move away from this passage uh, and consider the crucifixion in future weeks i want to i want to highlight one more lesson i want to ask an important question of you how are you responding to jesus how are you responding to jesus think about this in the passage who is it that is responsible for jesus's death there are three main options really you could say that it was the jewish leaders the chief priests and the elders. 
They are the ones, after all, who arrested him, who first put him on trial, who decided that he needed to die. And it's those men who were insistent with Pilate and insistent with Herod and again insistent with Pilate, making sure that Jesus must be put to death. You could say that without the chief priests and the elders, things uh, probably would have turned out differently for Jesus. You could pin the responsibility on the chief priests. But you could say, actually, the, the issue is not with the chief priests, the issue is with the crowd. After all, uh, Pilate didn't seem too frustrated with the chief priests. He, he was able to send Pilate over to Herod, and he was willing to send Jesus away when, it, when uh, Jesus was returned to him. But Pilate was afraid of the crowd. And when the crowd were baying for blood, when the crowd were asking to crucify Jesus and, and getting them to, to release Barabbas, that's when Pilate gave in and said, OK, I'll release him. So you could say the crowd is responsible. Or you could say, well, actually, it's Pilate himself. After all, he's the one who has authority. He's the one who finally gives the order. What would you say? Who do you think is responsible? I wonder what they would say if you had the chance to ask them. The chief priests and the elders might claim responsibility. Yes, they might say. It was our responsibility. We sincerely believe that he is up to no good. We sincerely believe that he must be put to death. We sincerely believe that he must be got rid of. And so we're happy to take credit for putting him to death. What about the crowd, though? Surely they might try and defend themselves. No, it wasn't, wasn't really our fault, was it? I mean, we were just told what to shout by the chief priests. I mean, they were telling us what to shout. And, you know, I, I didn't really know what was going on myself. I, I was just stood in the crowd and, and other people around me were shouting. And so I thought it'd be good to shout as well. I, I don't think you can really hold me responsible, they might say. What about Pilate? He certainly didn't want to re be responsible. No, I wanted nothing to do with him, he might say. I wanted him uh, away. I, I, I could see he was innocent and I didn't want to put him to death. Surely you can't hold me responsible. Surely it's them. You know, their responses, those three people, are very similar to the responses of people today when they're asked about who Jesus is. There are some people who are quite adamantly and openly opposed to Jesus. Perhaps people of other religions, perhaps people of no religion. And yet, the Bible holds the chief priests responsible, in part, for the death of Jesus. It's a reminder that sincere belief, whatever that belief might be in, sincere belief is not the measure that God uses to decide whether to forgive us, to decide whether to have mercy on us. We're so often told that just, just believe what you believe, just, just do what you're, you're doing, but do it wholeheartedly. And everything will be all right. Now the chief priests were doing things wholeheartedly. And yet they were doing things in error. And God's response to them will not be one of forgiveness and mercy. It will be one of judgment and condemnation. There are some who are led along by the crowd. Uh, just like those in the crowd. These people maybe don't think very closely about what they believe. They don't have very strong opinions about who they might follow or, or what religion they're part of. They just kind of go along with the spirit of the age. Is that you? Do you know what you believe? Are you convinced about who Jesus is or isn't? There will not be any safety in numbers when we face God. The crowd did what they did because the people around them were doing the same. Because they were told to. When you face God at the judgment, he will ask you about your sin. And he will punish you for the sin on your head. Don't follow the crowd when it comes to choosing Jesus. Do what you know to be right. And then there are some who, like Pilate, would say that they are followers of Jesus. They, they accept him. They consider him to be who he says he is. But only when things are comfortable and only when it's easy for them to say so. But when opposition comes in, when people turn up who dislike Jesus and are stood against him, then those people are quite quick to turn their backs on him. Perhaps this is you. Perhaps especially if you've grown up in a Christian family. 
Your mum and dad are Christians. Your brothers and sisters are Christians. You go to church every week because, well, that's just what you do in your family. You read your Bible regularly. You know the answers to lots of questions about the Bible. Is that enough to make you a Christian? Is that enough for God to forgive you at forgiveness? Is that enough for your sins to be removed from your head just because, well, you're just like the people around you? Pilate's conviction about Jesus, Pilate's opinion about Jesus was not strong enough for Pilate to stand with Jesus even when everybody else was against him. And the question is the same for you. Do you love Jesus enough so that you would continue following him even if the people around you were against him? It's easy to follow Jesus when everybody around you is following him. It's easy to follow Jesus when your parents are taking you on to church every week since you were born. It's much more difficult to follow Jesus when the crowd hates him. True repentance and true faith in Jesus, the right response to Jesus, is the sort of response that says, Jesus, I will stand with you, whatever the crowd are saying, whatever the world is saying, however many people are against you, I'm going to follow you. And unless you are willing to make that type of commitment to Jesus, then there is no freedom from sin for you. Unless you're willing to give your whole life to Christ, unless you're willing to stand with Jesus, even through persecution and oppression and mockery, then there is no freedom from sin, from the damage it's doing to you, from the damage it's doing to those around you, and from the judgment it sends you to. I want to urge you this morning. Are you trusting Jesus? Have you responded to him in repentance and faith? Are you following him? Or are you, just for the moment, going on with the crowd, waiting to turn away when the going gets tough? There is only one way to be released from sin, and that is to give your life, your heart, your all to Jesus as your saviour. I'd love to be able to talk more with you about that. If you've got questions about what it means to become a Christian, you know, if we were here in the church, I could just catch you afterwards and we could have a chat. Uh, we can't do that now, obviously, but I would still love to answer your questions. Many of you have got access to my phone number. Otherwise, send me or Joseph an email. Uh, get in touch with us somehow. We would love to answer your questions. And perhaps if you are convinced that you ought to become a real follower of Jesus. Then at the end of the service, we'll have a little prayer come up on the screen. Consider the words of that prayer. Perhaps consider praying it for yourself. Repent from sin and become a follower of Jesus. Let's just pray to close our service. Our God, we thank you uh, for the gospel truth that Jesus is the one who went to the cross instead of us. And because of his death, because our sin was laid on him, we are then freed from sin. We're freed from the punishment we deserve for our sin. We're freed from condemnation. We're freed from judgment. And we're free from the damage it does. We're given the ability by your spirit who lives in us and changes us. We're given the ability to reject sin, to choose what is right, to live in a way that pleases and honours you. And so we pray that you'd help us to do that. Not to take the gospel as licence to sin but to take it for what it is, freedom from sin and an opportunity to serve you in a right way. We pray for those who are considering becoming a Christian. Father, would you send your spirit, convict and guide and instruct. We would love to see you drawing more and more people to Christ each and every week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.